Well, we are back in John. Uh, last week, we came back to John, the Gospel of John. We've been going through it for some time now. And we are in John 13, so if you have your Bibles, please open to John 13. This is an interesting transition in the, the uh, Gospel of John. Jesus just got through ministering publicly for about three and a half years, and now he's transferring into his private ministry, we call it, focusing on the people who are closest to him as disciples and close associates. Last week we saw Jesus himself give a beautiful example of the gospel message played out in a, an act of service to those he loves, his, his disciples. He was washing their feet. And it's also interesting how our Lord works. He goes from that amazing and beautiful picture of the gospel, washing someone's feet, to where we are today in doom. If you don't have the gospel, what happens? It's the other side of the coin. In verse 18 from last week, Jesus hints about one of the disciples not being a true follower. And he hints that one of them would betray him. And he hinted earlier in John 6 as well. But he wants his disciples not to be surprised at this because they're shaky in, in their faith. They're young people. You know, these disciples are probably in their 20s. They're not seasoned vets like uh, some of us are. Some of you are. <laughs> but, but these are younger people in the faith. And so he wants them to be steadfast. And he doesn't want them to be too shaken when Judas soon betrays him. He wants his disciples to know, I know what's coming. This needs to happen. Don't be shaken. He's giving them something to hold on to. Because I think that if they were surprised by Judas betraying Christ and they hadn't had kind of a heads up, they may be shaken. So he gives them a, a heads up. Because he knows that Judas betraying Christ is part of God's plan for redemption. It was part of plan, God's plan from the beginning. And today we'll see that the disciples in, in some ways are like us or we're like them in some ways. Uh, we're more ignorant than we think we are. And the disciples were more ignorant than they thought they were. But Jesus loves them to the end and he loves us to the end. As we read in the first verse of John 13. And we'll also see that nothing else matters except whether you have faith in Christ. And nothing you ever do or say, good or bad, will ever matter except whether Christ dwells in your heart. That's what matters. And so we pick up in John 13. We'll begin reading at verse 21. And John writes, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. No one at that table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon said to, Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? 
Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, this passage is, uh, gives us a, a look into an intimate part of your life, the last night of your life. You're speaking with those you love. I pray that you show us to who you are, what you're like. Every day we want to know more about you. And through this little window here in John 13, let us see more of that, more of who you are, more of what you did for us through these words. I pray that you lead me this morning as I present your word to your people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the scripture has us talking today about Judas. And we preach expositionally, uh, and so we go right through, and we're not skipping anything. Uh, you know, some people might think it's not a really happy topic to talk about Judas, the one who betrayed Christ, but it's in Scripture for a reason, and it's, it's in Scripture so that we can learn something. And so, we all know, we, we should all know probably by now who Judas Iscariot is, He's the one who betrayed, betrayed Christ in the most despicable way with a kiss. Matthew 26, he tell, Judas tells uh, the, the guards who will go arrest him how he will do it. He said, the one I'll kiss, that's the one, sees him. Can you imagine your friend who's been with you for three and a half years stabbing you in the back with a kiss? The worst kind of man. Worse than Brutus, who betrayed Julius Caesar. Maybe you remember that story. Worse than Benedict Arnold. We're only familiar really with him in this country, I think, mostly. The American traitor. And to this day, no one names their child Judas, do they? Do you know any Judases? Like we talked about uh, Jezebel. Do you know any Jezebels? I looked at uh, the Social Security Administration's website. We have about 330 million people in America today. And they, they estimate that there's about and they gave me this number, 329 Judases that are alive today in this country. Wow. So I, I'm assuming that the people maybe don't know the story and named their child Judas, but if you think of that, uh, it's about one in 10 million, so it's a very small number. 300 people out of the entire country named Judas. Uh, by contrast, uh, the number one name in the country is John, and that's about one in 100. I thought it would actually be a little less than that, uh, maybe one in 50, but... But one in 10 million, Judas, one in 100, John. Uh, not a popular name, and for good reason. He's got, Judas has this reputation now, 2,000 years later, for being uh, a traitor. Not a person you want to name your child after. Yet he played a role in God's plan of redemption. Though it was to his doom, it was part of the plan. And I wonder, uh, I wonder what, when I was putting the message together, what would God have us learn about Judas or from Judas? So let's look in verse 21. John writes, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And you think about him saying these words now. This group of people have been hanging out for three and a half years. And Jesus finally says, I have to tell you guys something. One of you will betray me. Your first note today says, Jesus is fully man and fully God. This is how he, he knew this. He didn't just suspect it. He didn't just do his homework and figure out there's a great po probability that one of you will betray me. He knew one of them would betray him because he's God. He, he knew the plan. At this point in his life, he knew the plan. He knows what's going to happen. And that gives his disciples a sense of encouragement to know, hey, our leader knows what's going to happen. He knows what's happening. We, we can't be shaken now. Where else... They may have been shaken. They probably would have been shaken if, if it just happened. But Jesus here feels the weight of his betrayal. He's got that divine nature. And he feels the weight there too because of the, un, the injustice that's about to happen. Christ is just and his trials are unjust. And he feels that weight also in his human spirit because he loves these guys. If any of you have ever been on a team in high school or college, you're with your team for your, your three or four years in high school or college, and then you go your, your separate ways. And by the end of that three or four years, you're close. 
you're like, I'm going to run through a brick wall for this guy or this gal. I know them. They're my brothers and sisters. They've been together for about that long. About as, far, as, about as long as a teen is in high school or college. Very close personal connections. So Jesus feels this weight. It says he was troubled. But he's also showing us that he is God. He's got supernatural knowledge about what is happening. In the next verse, 22 the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. They didn't even know who it was. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. He was close to him. So Simon Peter mentioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And think about what's happening here. They're having a meal. They've done this before. And the disciples don't know what's going on. They just heard this news from Jesus. Someone's going to betray me. One of you. And they don't know who it is. And in verse 23, John, the author of the gospel, doesn't refer to himself by name. He says, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John never refers to himself in his gospel. He just says the disciple that Jesus loved or the other disciple. And I think it's, it's a way to be humble. He doesn't want to draw attention to himself, always to Jesus. So he just sprinkles in these uh, ways to refer to himself. The one Jesus loved, the other disciple. Here he does the same thing. Humble Apostle John. And so these guys, I don't know how, maybe they were even late teenagers. Early 20s, mid-20s maybe. They're sitting around eating with Jesus and he says, one of you will betray me. And Peter doesn't want to ask Jesus. He says, John, you ask him. I don't want to ask him. I want to know, but I want you to ask him because I don't want to ask him. John, ask him. You're next to him, ask him. So John asked him. You know, they kind of act like kids. <laughs> you can imagine. In verse 26, Jesus answers. He answered, It is he who I'm, I give this morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do it quickly. The disciples, again, they didn't know who would betray Jesus, but Jesus knew. And it what may, may have been or could have been a, a historical account of uh, the worst day of Jesus' life up to that point when he was betrayed. It could have been a, a devastating story, a depressing story. This is the story of how Jesus was sold out. Jesus shows that he is God in all of this. He's not being defeated. He's in charge of what's happening. He's in charge of who's going to do it, what he's going to do, and when he's going to do it. Judas, he'll betray him. He knows that. He says, what you're going to do? Go do it and make sure you're quick about it. He's the one in control here. Your next note says, even in the worst possible circumstances, God is still in control. Jesus wasn't surprised by this. He commands his betrayer to do it quickly. When Judas, Jesus, or when Judas took the bread, John reports that Satan entered him. We don't see that very often in Scripture. Satan entered him. What can we learn about that? Well, we can learn that Judas was not a believer. He never was. He never tasted salvation. Satan never could have entered him if he was in Christ. That would be that would go against Scripture. Because all who are in Christ are indwelled, indwelled with the Spirit. Right? And, and sealed by that Spirit, we're told in Ephesians 4, until the day of redemption. Who seals you? Do you seal you? No, you don't seal you. You couldn't keep the seal. You'd break the seal in five minutes. And so would I. We are sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption, and Ephesians 4 tells us that. And if Judas was sealed by the Spirit before Satan entered him, Satan couldn't have entered him. The Spirit would never have allowed that. In fact, regarding Judas, we know from Scripture that he remained lost. In John 6, Jesus says, Did I not choose you, the twelve? He doesn't say the eleven. And yet one of you is a devil. By the words of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the night before he's arrested, he says of the disciples, I've guarded them. He's talking to the Father. And not one of them had been lost except for the son of destruction that the scripture may be fulfilled. He says, none of them are lost except one. 
One's lost. And he's lost so that the scripture may be fulfilled. I wondered what scripture that was, by the way, and it was, it's Psalm 109. A prophetic psalm about Judas mentions betrayal. It says, may his days be few, may another take his office. And if you read Psalm 109, you'll see it's a, it's a psalm and it reflects about Jesus' betrayal and his wrongful judgment. And another apostle did take Judas's place, Matthias. We read about in Acts chapter 1. Psalm 41 also foreshadows Judas' betrayal of Jesus, where it says, Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate bread, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. My close friend. My close friend. We know that Judas remained lost by Jesus' words again in Matthew 26. He says, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. I've heard people say, or I've seen things online that says, Jesus washed Judas' feet. And that's all it says. And I wondered what message they're trying to convey with that. Jesus washed Judas' feet. I think some people who may remind others of this might use that statement to convey an idea that you can sin grievously and wretchedly and Jesus still has to love you. He'll still wash your feet. You can do whatever you want. He'll affirm your sin. He'll accept you right into the, into the glorious gates of heaven just as you are. You don't have to make any changes to your life because he just loves you so much. That is not true. Psalm, what do you do with, with, with psalms like this? Passages like this, Psalm 5. The boastful, David's writing, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. What is another word for abhor? Hate. Psalm 11, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Your next note on this topic says, be careful. Don't take God's grace for granted. God extends perfect love but also extends perfect justice. Are there different ways that the Lord could love people? Are there different ways that you love different people? Could he love one who will eventually be lost and extend some common grace to them, still love them somehow, some way? He gives them the person that will be lost, he still gives them the enjoyment of his creation. They still may go on fishing trips and enjoy friendships and enjoy the feeling of accomplishment in life. Those are things that we call common grace. We enjoy being here. We have good days, we have bad days. Well, the good days, everyone gets the good days. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. That's common grace, we call that. Though they may never believe. But also, Can he extend his saving love, his saving grace to others? It's true, Jesus washed Judas' feet. But when the time came to explain what he had done to them, remember what he said in John 13, uh, 10 from last week? Jesus said, the one who has bathed, remember this, does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you, my disciples, are clean, but not every one of you. Not every one of you are clean. He knew. He still washed his feet and he knew he wasn't saved. We may experience the blessings of God on earth and not believe in him. And ultimately, we'll be lost. Like Judas was lost. If things in your life are going pretty well, you might think, God loves me. He must because I got enough money in the bank and and I just got a promotion and, and all these great things are happening to me. Don't equate that with salvation. You're being blessed and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. It might be raining on you in a good way, but you're not saved. Good things happen to good people and bad people. It's not about the amount of blessings you're getting. It's who's in your heart. And we know lost people always make excuses. We used to be lost at one point. We would make excuses for our sin. 
when we're confronted with the holiness of God. But Jesus knew what was in, in their hearts, and he knows what's in our hearts today. And yes, Jesus did wash Judas's feet, but that's what we might call common grace. But you know what? He didn't wash his heart. Judas didn't receive the saving grace of God, and Judas somehow did not believe. And don't be tempted to say, boy, if I was in Judas's feet, I, I for sure would have believed. I would have believed for sure, because I know that Jesus is the Son of God, and he's the only way. Well, I don't know. He was human. We're human. He was that close. You say, how could he not believe? He saw miracles done. He saw Jesus prophesying things that came through. But all those things were a judgment unto Judas because he did not believe. And it drove him further and further from Christ. Your next note says, you can be so close in proximity to Christ and to his people and not be in Christ. Look at Judas. How much closer can you get? He walked with them. He talked with them. Don't ever confuse, I said this last year sometime, don't ever confuse your proximity to Christ with your salvation in Christ. Just because you go to church every week, just because you know the Lord's Prayer by heart or the Ten Commandments and you give in the offering and you, you do all the Christian things, don't equate that with salvation. You're really close. You know all the people in church. You know the pastor. Don't equate that with salvation. Judas was right there in, in the thick of it. It's not the same thing. We can learn this from Judas today. Judas was close. Judas was very close. But he wasn't in Christ. I've mentioned over the past couple of weeks that we can be like Peter, and I think we kind of understand that. We can let our emotions take over. We can speak out of turn. Speak before we think and all those types of things. We can be like Peter. I think we would all agree. But don't be like Judas. Don't be so close but not really in Christ. Because it happens. Verse 28. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. All the disciples didn't hear what Jesus said. He must have said it under his breath, or maybe the room was uh, loud with voices and, and laughter, whatever, after the, a meal, people relaxing. All the disciples didn't hear what he said to Judas, and so they kind of caught half of that, and they thought, what was that? Oh, he must be going to get some food for the Passover, maybe he's going to give to the poor. They didn't catch it. They didn't really know what was happening. They we're not clear about it for, for sure. But Jesus knew what was happening. And when Judas left, we read in verse 30 that he went out and it was night. And it made me wonder why John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote that last phrase, and it was night. And I wondered, was that necessary? It seemed like kind of an an add-on to the end of the sentence there. Why does it matter if it's night or not? I don't know. So many times in the scripture, those who are eternally lost are sent out into outer darkness. And I wondered if there was a parallel here. Because I wondered, was it really necessary for John to write? And it was night. And by the way, it was nighttime. But he didn't just go out into the night. In truth, Judas was ultimately sent into outer darkness. Which is where we would all go if left to our own devices and our own sinful natures, we'd all be in outer darkness without Christ. And so at that point, after Judas is sent out to betray Jesus, the plan is now set in motion. That's kind of the catalyst. He's going to go now and tell the guards where they're staying and they're going to come and then it's going to all be over. At that moment, there was no going back. Jesus had lived his life to this point, had his ministry to this point, had a nice meal with his disciples, and now he's sending off the messenger to begin the final act. And there's no going back now. And finally, what does Jesus say? What's his perspective here? Is he discouraged? Does he call the apostles together and say, now let's pray against Judas because he's going to go out and betray me? Is he discouraged? Does he say, oh no, now what? What have I done? 
How does Jesus respond once the final phase is set in motion now and, no, and you can't stop it? Verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Jesus, Judas is sent away to be quick about betraying Jesus. And what does Jesus immediately say? Now I'm glorified. It's like he's saying, finally, and God is glorified in me. He basically sends away the man who will be the catalyst to start Jesus' unjust arrest, his sham trials, his convictions, his crucifixion and murder. And what does Jesus say? Nobody can stop me now. He knows he's victorious. He always knew he would be. But how would we react in those situations? Are we going to say, ain't no one going to stop me now? Everything's look perfectly set up. When my, if anyone looked at my life, they'd say, your life is a mess. Someone's going to arrest you. They're going to kill you tomorrow. He says, finally, ain't no one stopping me now. It's a different perspective than we have. Your next note says, the Lord does his best work when we are in our darkest places. You could probably attest to that <clears throat> if I went around the room. So when was... God, most apparent in your life, you'd say at the worst of times. That was the worst day of my life. And you know what? Somehow he gave me joy and peace. I don't understand it. It's the peace that passes all understanding. That's God. That's when he's glorified most, when all seems lost. Well, to the disciples, if he hadn't told them what was going to happen, in their minds, all would have been lost. It's when he shines brightest in our lives. Is that how you responded in your last hardship? And I know we've had hardships. I think all of us could say no. That is not how I responded. In fact, I'm ashamed of how I responded. Of course not. We're not Christ. But we're in Christ. If you're a believer, you're in Christ. Paul uses that term, that phrase, about 80 times in the New Testament. He loves using that phrase. You're in Christ. And in Colossians 3, we're told that not only are we in Christ, but we're, our lives are hidden in Christ, in God. So we are like double, triple wrapped up in God and in Christ and we are good to go. <clears throat> Ultimately, we will be saved. We will see glory. And just like uh, in a song we sang, even if I lose it all, I'll still never lose hope. <clears throat> I'll never lose hope. So we would do well to see how Jesus would react in a way. Remember the old bracelets, what would Jesus do? So what would Jesus do here? And then do likewise with the help of the Spirit. Because we're not able to do what Jesus would do in our flesh. We need the Spirit's help with that. To be patient when you, shouldn't, when you don't feel like being patient. Because we all think we're more patient than we are. It's true. We all think we're, we know more than we know. It's true. We're more ignorant than we think we are. And that's all true. We need the Spirit's help. And if you don't know how ignorant you are, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> And so then now, G Judas is gone. He's, he's doing his thing to betray Christ, and Jesus focuses back on his faithful ones in verse 33. He says, Little children, yet a little while, and I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I had said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Back in John 7, Jesus refers to, in John 13, back to what he said in John 7, when he was talking to the Jews about the same thing. He says, I'm going away in John 7, and you'll seek me, and you'll die in your sin. He told the Pharisees, you're going to be looking for me, but you're going to die in your sin. Here are the disciples, he's telling, you'll seek me. And later he'll say, you're going to follow me where I'm going. He's making a distinction. He's drawing a line. And he tells the Pharisees back in John 7, where I'm going, you can't come. You are from below. I'm from above, he says. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. You are of your father, the devil. You are not of God. Jesus makes these distinctions in his ministry. All the way up to the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and whoever the Jewish leaders were, He's drawing lines. You're in or you're out. You're of your father, the devil, or of our father, God. 
And he's calling the Pharisees, these Jewish leaders, sons of their father, the devil. And there was a devil in his midst that night. Among the twelve, he's making a distinction. You're either of God or you're of the devil. There's no third category. And since these who remain with Jesus are of God, Judas has left now. He instructs them with a new commandment. He says, love one another. The way I loved you, that's how I want you to love each other. And how did Jesus love them? Remember back to verse 1 in in chapter 13. How did Jesus love us? To the end. Jesus loved them all the way, to the utmost. The most you could love someone. He says, love each other like that. And that's how the world is going to know who my people are. How they love each other. Your next note says, God's people, that's us, should love one another the way Jesus loves his people. We love each other different ways. We love our spouses different than we love our brothers and sisters. And the love between a parent and a child is different than the love between a, a father and a brother and a son. And a, there's just different kinds of love, ways to express love. But the love between God and his people, they call it agape love, is how he wants us to love each other. I love you no matter what. I love you no matter what. That's what Jesus would say to his people, no matter what. How do we love our brethren in Christ? Would anyone suspect that we're Christian by how we're loving our brothers and sisters in Christ? If they didn't know already. Would would they say, if they looked at one of us, that must be a Christian. I bet you they're a Christian. Or would they have no clue? Because it should be apparent to the world. Jesus is telling us. That's how the world's going to know us, by how we love each other. This is a new commandment for them. God's people loves what God loves. And God loves the church. Because what is the church? It's not a building. It's, it's the congregation of believers. It's you and me. God loves his people, his family. He loves his church. Do you feel a distinct love for God's people? You probably feel a difference between if you meet someone over at the hardware store, and you realize, oh, he's a believer, all of a sudden you got a little connection there. I, I ran into two people yesterday in a parking lot, and we figured out that we're, we're all Christians, and then like the, the conversation kind of changed, and it was, we're like friends all of a sudden. There's just that extra thing that you notice between God's people. We should have that. We should recognize that. That's a, that's a, a grace that he's given his people, a brotherhood. <clears throat> But Judas, Judas didn't show that love for God's people. We're told that he was selfish and he was greedy and he was self-centered. He would take money out of the money bag. He was like the treasurer of the group. Matthew, we see it in Matthew 26 and John 12. He sold Jesus out, his, his friend, I thought, for 30 pieces of silver, money. He was a traitor. He betrayed Christ. Well, what about Peter? Peter. Peter shows up here again. This is where we can kind of say, well, maybe Peter would have done what I would have done because I'm, I feel like we're kind of like Peter. And maybe that's just me. But I think we can relate. What about Peter, what he did? Look at verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Aren't those great words? At least I'm going to follow you later. Like when he was washing the disciples' feet, he said, do you know what I've done to you? And he says, he knew he didn't, they didn't understand. But he said, you're going to understand later. You'll get it later. Here again, he says, you can't follow me now, Peter, but you will later. What is that called? Hope. Okay, later. I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll settle for later. He says in verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. I feel like I have this connection with Peter. God, I'd do anything for you. 
I want to go with you. Take me with you. Why can't I go now? I would die for you. Jesus says, will you though? Peter would end up dying for his faith in Christ. But not before he denied Christ three times in the next 24 hours. We don't think we're as ignorant as we are. We think we're smarter than we are. We think we're more faithful than we are. That's why we need Christ to get us through, to get us there. Because if it's left up to us, we're going to be gung-ho. Yes, I can do it. And within 24 hours, we're going to deny Christ three times. Because our, we're weak. We're like the disciples. We don't understand. We don't get it. We whine because we can't do it now. We can't go now. That's why we rely on Christ to do it for us. That's the gospel. Peter asked Jesus, where are you going? Wouldn't you ask Jesus too? What do you mean you're leaving? Where are you going? He says, you can't go where I'm going. And then, of course, we would say, well, why can't I go? He says, you can come later. I can't come now. We always want to know. We always want it now. We always want to go now. I don't know if it's our culture or what, or just human nature. We want what we want. We want it when we want it. And if we don't have it, we're going to cry and whine and complain. We're not patient. And it's because we're more ignorant and less patient, patient than we think we are. We all have this great skill of overestimating ourselves, don't we? But Jesus comes near to us to give us that knowledge that we need, that we don't have, but we think we do. He says, I'm here to give you that knowledge through the, through the word, through his life that the, the apostles wrote down. Here's how you can be informed, more informed. He comes close to us to give us, to teach us that patience because we're going to need it. And we're so emotional. We say, why can't I go? Just think of Peter, you know, if he's in his mid-20s. Why can't I go, Jesus? How come? Well, it's just like you're whining, like, hey, grow up here. Some big stuff's going to happen in, in about 24 hours. I need you to grow up a little bit. You can't go, okay? You'll come later. Got it, Peter? You know, I'm going to see him saying, okay, fine, fine. You know, <laughs> he's human like you and me. We would do the same thing. We're like that. I'll do anything for you. I'll die for you, Jesus. He says, be careful. Will you? You don't know what you're saying. Like when he told the disciples, which one's going to be next to you in the, in the kingdom? Is it me? Is it my brother? Who's going to be? Can I sit on your right hand? How about your left hand? Jesus says, you don't even know what you're asking. You don't even know what you're talking about. I've said it again a couple of, for the last couple of weeks. We're like Peter. We overestimate ourselves. We, we let our emotions get in the best of us. And still Jesus loves us because he knows that's just Peter. It's just Peter. He still loves us. Your, your next note here says, instead of elevating ourselves, we should admit to ourselves that we live only by God's grace. We take our next breath only because of God's grace, only because he allows it. And we're nothing special. And so I want to ask you this question. What do you think is better? What do you think is better out of these two choices? Betraying Christ once or denying him three times? Is, is there a right answer? But Jesus makes distinctions. Jesus draws lines in the sand. And the truth is, both Judas and Peter's actions that they deserved eternal punishment. But Peter received grace. And Judas received justice. No one receives injustice with God. What's the difference? Judas betrayed Christ. Peter denied Christ. Peter received grace. Judas received justice. What's the difference? Why did one receive eternal life and one received eternal punishment? Because Jesus draws distinctions. He draws lines. And these two were on different sides of the line. What's the dividing line? Right down the middle, faith in Christ. That's it. What side are you on? You can deny me three times and have faith and he'll give you grace. 
You can sell me out once, not have faith, and receive justice that you're due. What side of the line are you on? They were both with Jesus for three and a half years. They knew him. He knew them. They knew each other. They probably never suspected that anyone would sell him out. They both shared meals with him. They pr- both laughed and cried with him and saw his miracles and, and helped him do the good works. But one remained lost. He was so close to that dividing line of faith. You imagine how many times he could have just believed. But he never took that final step. Matthew records that it would have been better for Judas if he were never born. Tragic. Paul warns believers in 2 Corinthians 13. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourselves to make sure you're not just close to the faith. That you're not just acting the part of a Christian. Examine your hearts to see whether you are in the faith. We all do foolish things. We've all messed up, made mistakes, big mistakes. We don't understand what God's doing all the time. We get confused about his plans. We all want to know what's happening and we want him to let us know clearly now what or else. We mess up. But what's more important than our mistakes is what's in our hearts. Because Peter made big mistakes and Judas made big mistakes. But the difference was what was in their heart. Have you put your faith in Christ? If you have, your sins are covered by his grace. And if your faith is in yourself or anything else, anything other than Christ, your sins remain. And they have not been atoned for by the blood of Christ. You'll have to atone for them. How long does it take to burn off a sin against an infinitely holy God? I'd venture to say eternity. But if you are in Christ, then there's nothing that can take you away from God's love. Romans 8, 38, remember that verse? There's nothing that can tear us away from God's love for us. Nothing. We serve a God who saves wretched sinners like you and me. And he deserves all the glory in it. And there's nothing you can do. Nothing that ever is going to matter except whether you have your faith in Christ and whether you're you're in Christ or not. That's the dividing line, faith in Christ. You can look the part and not be a Christian. You can not be a Christian and not look the part. You can, all that stuff doesn't matter. Do good deeds. Christ isn't in your heart. Well, then you're on this side. You're not, you're not going to be experiencing salvation, the grace of God. You're going to love God and his people with that faith in Christ. And that's our blessed hope is that we can mess up and we can mess up big time like Peter did. And God's grace is sufficient to cover that. So don't think you're ever too far away either from God. We have friends that probably feel like oh, they could, God could never save me anymore. Be an encouragement to them. Tell them about Peter. Tell them about all the other big names in scripture that really messed up but they're saved today. We serve a God who saves wretched sinners like you and me. And there's hope in that. Next week, we'll get into John 14, like Mike mentioned, and we were talking to David earlier about John 14. They call that the upper room discourse. It's when Jesus is talking to the ones he knows are in God, in Christ. And uh, interesting things there, wouldn't you say? So we'll look forward to that. Uh, In any case, please stand with me as we close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, once again we come here humbly to learn. Uh, I hope we can all admit to ourselves that we're not as patient as we think and we're, we're probably more ignorant than we think we are. Help us to learn humility. Uh, keep us teachable and keep us ever hungry to learn more about who you are and what you promised us because those are the things that are going to get us through the tough times in life. Uh, nothing else, only faith in Christ. 
Lord, bless us this week. Continue to minister to the people around us and within our group that really need you with physical healings and with relational things and everything else that this world gives us. But keep our hopes up, keep our spirits high so that you'll be glorified even in the midst of our trials so that others can see the joy of the Lord that we have in our hearts and, and that they would be drawn to you because of our uh, dealings. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.